Welcome back to Dad and Tobago. I'm Hema Ramson. Thanks again for inviting us into your homes. And we're coming to you live from the Crown Plaza Hotel. And the reason we're here, the Trinidad and Tobago Chamber of Industry and Commerce, they're hosting their annual post-budget panel discussion. It begins this morning at 8 a.m. And we're going to continue our live uh, broadcast of the events this morning. But we're going to continue looking at the budget. Joining us on set right now, the Chief Operating Officer of the Anson McHale Group, Jerry Brooks, and also a Vice President of the Trinidad and Tobago Manufacturers Association, Nicholas Lockchak. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for Good joining us. Good morning, Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. Good now, morning. yesterday, one of the largest expenditure profiles ever presented to the population of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Brooks, your thoughts on what was presented to the country yesterday? I thought yesterday's budget was a super good technical budget. There were several things that we in business like, and there were several things that I think was concerned. Um, it certainly wasn't a business as usual kind of budget. There were dates and specifics around Clico. And there's a clear intent and objective to bring the Clico in past and end, i.e. the second tranche of, of um, Republic Bank shares, or the first tranche of Republic Bank shares. There was a stimulus for the construction sector. He did not raise corporate and personal taxes, which I think is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, he indicated very clearly that I intend to balance the budget by 2016. And there was a commitment to the HSF Fund, the Heritage and Stabilization Fund, at $4.5 billion, which acts as a buffer in the event of difficulty. He talked about the IPO of TTMF and HMB, and he also talked about the IPO of First Citizens Bank. And he outlined some very specific projects to stimulate the economy. There were some concerns, however. One is that the budget arithmetic is still very opaque. Mm -hmm. Where are these revenues going to come from? Does the country have the capacity to spend $58.4 billion? The PSIP implementation of some $7 billion last year. What happened in 2012? Why was it not implemented? What about some of the other projects that he announced in 2012? For example, the SABIC project. Why is the economy stagnating? He spoke about international conditions, but he never really got into why is the economy stagnating and what are we going to do differently? The debt stock is rising because when one takes a look at the deficit, the deficit projected for, for 2012 is 7 billion. It probably is going to come in at a bit less. But assuming that the, debt, the deficit is approximately 20 billion dollars and you add that 80 billion, you're now running at about 100 billion dollars in terms of debt. That is twice times your GDP. Can we be more aggressive around the, 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 the um, alleviation of our debt? And how are you going to manage debt stock in relation to GDP? Um, so there are some things that uh, I, I think that were cause for concern. The other big thing that I think he needed to do was to drive governance. If right. you are really serious about value, what you need to do is to say to government ministries, I shall give you an allocation of 10% less. You have to demonstrate us how you're going to be more efficient, how you're going to re-engineer business process, and how you're going to have leaner government. So those are some things that are certainly a good starting point for discussion. Leaner government, Mr. Lockjack. Confidence, investments, stimulating economic activity. You know, I think that one of the major things that came out of yesterday's budget is that if we can execute on all the things that the minister put forward, that confidence is key. I believe that the state of Clico and HCU um, item, for instance, whether I agree with it or don't agree with it, I think that bring it to a, a short and end this year would just generate confidence and predictability. I think predictability is what businesses are looking for to invest with. As long as we know what's happening, you know, even if we have the bad news, give us the bad news, but give it to us clearly and upfront. Then we know how to manage our businesses, how to make investments. As you know, business makes investments on a long-term basis. So I was very heartened to hear that the, the minister planned to balance the budget by 2016, which showed a capacity and an and a intention to look beyond just the, the one-year budget right. and look more medium-term with a... With a quantitative amount of plan that you'll reduce it by 1% a year till balanced in 2016. Now he announced the objective. Did he actually announce a strategy that we can use to implement that or to achieve that? Well, first of all, I'd like to um, say that, he, as he mentioned in his budget speech, he only had three months to prepare this budget. Um, I suppose, given that time frame, is a very commendable uh, budget and seemed to get the pulse of everything that needed to happen. Um, I think that all along the budget, not just in the HCU or CLECO, I think all the budget needs more consultation, more... We look forward to the debates and debates in government and the contribution of all the different ministers because, I mean, a lot of money is being spent. And we need to understand from the operating level of the, of the government what these ministries are doing because once the Minister of Finance sets his budget plan, which is how the, an overall strategy for the company's country sorry, is going to operate, I think it's key that we put, push the accountability down to the individual ministries to commit to certain projects, commit to getting it done, and if we can spend 
75 to 80 percent of the planned expenditure uh, with, in true investment, I believe we'll be well on our way towards creating that confidence and I think that it'll pick up us, its own momentum and get the whole economy going. Are you any more confident today than you were two days ago, Mr. Brooks? Confidence is something that has to be earned over time. Yeah. And you have to do a number of things to drive confidence. There is no doubt that Section 34 has shaken the confidence of both the local business community, the local community, and the international community. How are we going to restore confidence? We're going to restore confidence by a clearly articulated vision, one. Two, we're going to restore confidence by accountability and by demonstrating that we have the will where people are to bring them to justice. In that regard, I renew my call for prosecutions in the case of the HCU matter and in the case of the Clico matter. You cannot be spending 20 billion, 18.7 billion or 18.6 billion, which is approximately 40% of your GDP and not do anything. And consider because you have made some of the <coughs> policyholders whole that that is the end of the matter. You need to also strengthen the legislation in the credit union sector. You need to bring to book the Insurance Act you need to revamp the Securities Act. So there are a couple of things that need to be done from a governance perspective. In the cabinet itself, one is, it, one is to take a look at the methodologies about how notes are brought to cabinet. And I think in that regard, the, pre, the acting president's recommendations are something that need to occur. So several things need to happen. One is that you need to strengthen accountability. Two, you need to take a look at the governance structure. And I'm going to be a bit controversial this morning. The integrity legislation needs to be reviewed. The integrity legislation is not catching anyone, number one, and two, it is acting as a bar to good people coming to serve in the public service. People who have experience, people who have skill, people who have proven track records, and in a small society where there's limited capability, where there's limited expertise, you need your best minds on problems. Inefficient and bureaucratic systems actually encourage corruption and promote corruption. Do you think that corrupt, corrupt, uh, all the corrupt practices are being protected? I think that not enough is being done to expose and to prosecute corrupt practices. And if you take a look at Trinidad and Tobago's ranking in terms of corruption, it's not a flattering ranking. So several things need to be done. One is that we need to, from a police service standpoint, to improve our detection capability. The suite of legislation, particularly white collar legislation, needs to be enhanced and it needs to be strengthened. We also need to take a look at the criminal justice system and see how do we accelerate the time frame in which matters are brought to court. When people across the society see examples being made of persons who, in the case of the Hindu Credit Union, it's 700 million. In the case of, it's, in the case of Clico, it's 18 billion. In the case of Madoff and Stanford, both are in jail today. Right. So we need to demonstrate very visibly across the country that we shall not tolerate lawlessness. Discipline is not simply going to be a motto, but it's going to be a mantra that we follow religiously. Diversification of the manufacturing sector, it's about 7%. Looking to stimulate that activity, expand the profile of the manufacturing sector, the initiatives offered in the budget, was it enough? The key thing is that we met with the Minister of Finance before the budget. And the key thing that manufacturers have been asking for by the TTMA is we didn't want any more incentives. The manufacturing sector has been around for the last 50 years. We're very strong, very well capitalized. What we need is, in, what we need is more incentive to invest. And by that I mean what we've asked for is a removal of the disincentives, as, as Dominic Hardy, my president, has been saying all along. Um, we hardened to hear about a new port, but we didn't hear anything about investment in our current ports. So while we may look long term, and, and another option is always great, we're not hearing about the 50 year old cranes that we have on the current port today. And the Asakura system that are still being implemented. So we are happy to hear that they plan to do it by the next quarter, but it, it, a lot of operational stuff needs to happen as well. Ima, it's uh, the advanced passenger and cargo list is key. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Brooks talked about national security just now and the police. We've been asking for scanners in the port which will increase um, national security of all good, all cargo coming in, as well as it will help to speed up things in the port. So I think that from a manufacturing point of view, you could look at GDP allocation or you could look at what does the manufacturing sector bring. It brings a disproportionate amount of jobs to, via its GDP. Right. So the energy sector is huge in, in GDP um, contribution, but not as huge in its job creation. And I think that given a full employment, um, if I looked at internationally, the countries that have weathered the storm the best have been the ones with strong manufacturing bases. So Germany, Switzerland, these places are 24% of their GDP come from manufacturing. And not big manufacturers, but small, multitude of manufacturers.